Okay, the hepatobiliary system. We must first begin by looking at one of the most common things that occurs with the hepatobiliary system. And this is cholecystitis. Uh, cholecystitis is defined as an inflammation of the gallbladder that occurs most commonly because of an obstruction of the cystic duct from cholecystitis or stones in the gallbladder. 90% of these cases involve stones in the cystic duct, uh, which we label as calculus cholecystitis because it's caused by a stone, with the other 10% of cases representing a calculus cholecystitis, which means that there is an absence of a stone. Acute calculus cholecystitis is caused by obstruction of the cystic duct, leading to distension of the gallbladder. As the gallbladder becomes distended, blood flow and lymphatic drainage are compromised, leading to mucosal ischemia and necrosis. Uh, an estimated 10 to 20 percent of Americans have gallstones, and as many as one third of these people develop acute cholecystitis. A cholecystectomy for either recurrent biliary colic or acute cholecystitis is the most common major surgical procedure performed by general surgeons, resulting in approximately 500,000 operations annually. And there's reason to believe, based on our diet, that this could potentially even go higher uh, to where we see more and more people uh, having to have their gallbladder removed. So, what causes cholecystitis? Uh, one of the things is that it's uh, primarily a, a sex-based um, problem, meaning that females, on average, seem to have a tend uh, seem to have a higher uh, discrepancy for cholecystitis. Um, for for some reason, uh, we, which we don't really understand. Um, this actually happens. Uh, certain ethnic groups, uh, obesity or rapid weight loss, this is the one that you uh, typically see a lot of. Um, people who have uh, either either they're extremely overweight or they've lost weight very rapidly. For some reason this causes uh, cholecystitis. Drugs, especially hormonal therapy in women. Um, Pregnancy, increasing age, critical illness, sepsis, diabetes, and prolonged fasting. Um, which uh, prolonged fasting would kind of go under the banner of rapid weight loss. Um, and, and many of these things we really don't understand as to why it actually causes cholecystitis. So the most common presenting symptom of acute cholecystitis is upper abdominal pain. I'm sure we all understand that. Uh, signs of peritoneal irritation may be present, and in some patients, the pain may radiate to the right shoulder or scapula. Um, sometimes you can press on the right upper quadrant, and actually uh, the patient will feel severe pain. However, that's not always the case. Um, if you'll notice that where the pain is actually radiating to the right shoulder and or scapula, uh, sometimes patients think that because it's radiating to their back, uh, either they have a dissecting aorta or uh, they're having a heart attack uh, because some of these pain and symptoms actually mirror things uh, that are even more severe than this. Uh, frequently, the pain begins in the epigastric region and then localizes to the right upper quadrant. Although the pain may initially be described as colicky, it becomes constant in virtually all cases. What we mean by colicky is that it uh, comes and goes. Uh, usually it's marked by a sudden onset and then it pretty much clears itself up in a very rapid amount of time. And so, uh, and, and you usually see this with patients having uh, gallbladder problems. Uh, they'll eat something and then the pain will be so intense and so severe and it'll actually come on and then uh, over the course of time within a few hours the pain has died down uh, or there may not be any pain at all. And that's what we mean by colic. Uh, nausea and vomiting are generally present and patients may report fever. Uh, fever does not have to be uh, reported in this. 
uh, to be actually diagnosable. But nausea and vomiting are usually what you're going to see. Okay, so how do you do? Uh, how, how do you actually diagnose cholecystitis? Uh, number one, lab test. You can look for uh, elevated white blood cell count in the CBC, a comp, uh, elevated uh, bilirubin levels in bloodstream, uh, alkaline phosphate or phosphatase, uh, elevated in 25% of all the cases. Um, ultrasound. Uh, which we all know is the gold standard when it comes to imaging uh, the hepatobiliary system uh, there's really no substitute for ultrasound because ultrasound uh, can just provide a greater degree of differentiation than what anything else can a uh, CTM and pelvis with IV contrast uh, to demonstrate gangrene gas formation and perforation um, but that's about all CT can really do uh, MRI it's effective for pregnant women because of the lack of radiation exposure uh, but when it all comes down to it, when the rubber meets the road, uh, ultrasound is what you're going to want and followed up by a HIVA scan. Um, a HIVA scan is going to check and see what the ejection fraction uh, is for the gallbladder, uh, much the same way that the heart has an ejection fraction, uh, and see if the gallbladder is just not even pushing any bile out. And if no bile is escaping the gallbladder, then you pretty much know that you have problems there. Uh, the most common findings on CT are this. Uh, we're going to typically look for gallstones and wall thickening. Uh, these are your two major things to look for. Um, and chances are this is what you're going to see. Uh, Pericholocystic fluid. Uh, inflammation in the pericholecystic fat, subserosal sub edema seen by poor definition of the gallbladder liver wall interface, uh, air in the gallbladder, or air in the gallbladder wall. And if you see air in the gallbladder, uh, this is called uh, emphysematous cholecystitis. And so emphysematous meaning uh, air and air in the gallbladder. Uh, seen a few cases like that where you actually have air in the gallbladder but typically uh, the two most common signs are gallstones and wall thickening okay here we have um, a CT of not just for the gallbladder but uh, we've kind of combed in on this area because this is where the pathology really is um, but I'd also like to suggest that probably the liver don't look real good either based on these borders here. Um, possibly some cirrhosis starting to initially go. Um, but as we can see, we have both IV and oral contrast here. And so uh, we see this area here, uh, the gallbladder. We see that we have uh, what looks to be this white ring and I hope that everyone can see this uh, this white ring kind of going around the outside of the gallbladder uh, that's the gallbladder wall and uh, usually this little area here is not going to be considered to be too thick but what we're looking at for thickness is probably this area this area seems thicker but notice we don't see really anything on the inside of the gallbladder, it all looks kind of uniform. But we're going to say that this is cholecystitis simply because we have irregular thickening of the gallbladder wall. Okay, uh, this one is a little easier to kind of differentiate. Um, this person's abdomen, uh, let's just initially start by saying this person's abdomen kind of looks really messy uh, looks like they've got a lot of fecal material we've got some here uh, stomach I don't even know what's going on in the stomach there uh, because there looks like a lot of food in the stomach um, which all of these symptoms all of this other stuff could be caused by what we see 
uh, that's that's one of the things that you're going to want to get um, kind of in the, in the habit of looking for is a gallstone. Uh, not all gallstones will show up on CT, but the ones that do, uh, you're going to be able to see them very well. Um, and this is your gallbladder. And uh, if you look, you can see the white ring around the gallbladder. And so uh, it kind of gets a little thicker in this area here. But the real kind of uh, giving away point is you have this area here, and you kind of see this shadow around the gallbladder. Uh, that is uh, pericholocystic fluid. And then you have this. Uh, this is a gallstone. Uh, lodged kind of at the neck of the gallbladder and um, pretty much that is what's uh, going to cause tons of problems that's what's causing everything else and uh, as you can see the gallbladder looks kind of huge um, and so this person probably does need to have their gallbladder removed uh, probably experiencing severe pain and probably not even been able to uh, when you eat a nice fatty meal you're probably not able to actually release this uh, concentrated bile and so uh, things are not getting broken down the way that they need to be because of inadequacy here so uh, one thing to look for as you'll as you'll recall a lot of uh, some of the cases where you're going to see a gallstone or you're going to see wall thickening in this case we're actually fortunate to see both okay this one is kind of um, uh, an excellent case uh, you see the gallbladder here and you see this little thing here this here and then you have this so uh, what we have here and here is air and so this means that we have an emphysematous gallbladder uh, also we have a, a gallstone here uh, but perhaps the most concerning let me erase all of this uh, perhaps the most concerning thing about all of this is we have air here and um, if we have the ability to actually utilize lung windows, uh, potentially we might be able to see if this is free air or not. Uh, it kind of looks like it has a defined shape, uh, but sometimes free air can kind of trick you into thinking that it's not free air. And so uh, it would be uh, really interesting to know whether this is actually a perforated gallbladder or not. Uh, and you're actually seeing free air here. Uh, we don't have the uh, fortunate uh, means of looking at uh, additional layers in the scan, so it's a little hard to see. Uh, but this air that I have circled here is a little concerning. Uh, but just uh, kind of get in the habit of looking for anything to be in the gallbladder, like the air or a gallstone, um, because any of these things can actually. Uh, show up and, and a lot of times it's on patients that you don't expect it. Uh, I've had several patients that have uh, serious things wrong with uh, them and them act totally normal uh, and they'll be nice, cool, calm, collected and uh, it's usually those patients that you have to look out for because there's actually something wrong with them. Um, So that brings us to uh, cholithiasis. Uh, cholithiasis is the medical term for gallstone disease. Uh, gallstones are concretions uh, that form in the biliary tract, usually in the gallbladder. Gallstones develop insidiously, and they may retain and they may remain asymptomatic for decades. Um, so that's the thing. Just because you have gallstones 
doesn't mean that you're going to have problems because of the gallstones. Uh, just uh, know this, that many can be asymptomatic. You can scan patients and see gallstones uh, and the patient never have a bit of problems until one day that these stones actually start moving and causing serious um, inflammation. A migration of a gallstone into the opening of the cystic duct um, may block the outflow of bile during the gallbladder contraction. Uh, this results in gallbladder wall tension and produces a characteristic type of pain. Uh, cystic duct obstruction, if it persists for more than a few hours, may lead to acute gallbladder inflammation. And so basically, uh, what you have here is that the cystic duct may actually get blocked. And, and so if uh, you kind of draw a gallbladder here, And you get a stone lodged here, and there's nothing that can get through. Well, your gallbladder is trying to contract and trying to shove everything through, but because it can't, it actually irritates the gallbladder, and, and initially it starts as pain. And so basically, it, you you just try and. Um, push this stone through uh, and that's where that pain is coming from however if this obstruction is not able to be dislodged or stuff uh, or bile is not able to get around the obstruction uh, then it can actually cause gallbladder inflammation and that's where you actually get uh, cholecystitis where your gallbladder becomes inflamed because of this blockage uh, chronically Gallstones in the gallbladder may cause progressive fibrosis and loss of function of the gallbladder, a condition known as chronic cholecystitis. Chronic cholecystitis predisposes, the gall predisposes a patient to gallbladder cancer. Uh, and gallbladder cancer can be uh, kind of a very, very nasty cancer. Uh, you don't see a whole lot of it, but it can be very, very aggressive sometimes. Uh, formation of gallstones. Uh, gallstone formation occurs because certain substances in bile are present in concentrations that approach the limits of their solubility. Uh, when bile is concentrated in the gallbladder, it can become supersaturated, supersaturated with these substances, which then uh, precipitate from a uh, solution as microscopic crystals. Uh, the crystals are trapped in the gallbladder mucus, producing gallbladder sludge. And you'll hear this um, kind of phrased around a lot, uh, sludge in the gallbladder or gallbladder sludge. Uh, and that's because of these crystals. Over time, the crystals grow, aggregate, and fuse to form macroscopic stones. Uh, occlusion of the ducts by sludge and or stones produces the complications of gallstone disease. Uh, this is what you really want to keep in mind. This is the last bullet point. Uh, the two main substances involved in gallstone formation are cholesterol and calcium uh, bilirubinate. So uh, there's several different types of stones. Uh, and the two that we're going to focus on is cholesterol stones and black and brown pigment stones. Uh, and we'll see that they actually uh, result from different things. Cholesterol stones result from obesity, pregnancy, gallbladder stasis, drugs, and heredity. And so uh, some of this stuff is things that we can control like obesity, uh, drugs, uh, things like that. And basically the thing that you have to focus on cholesterol stones is a lot of the times it just kind of forms from your diet and what kind of choices you make in terms of dieting. Um, black and brown pigment stones, as you'll notice, these are uh, things that you really can't prevent, such as sickle cell anemia, a hereditary serocytosis, and beta thalassemia.
So the symptoms of coleithiasis. Uh, gallstones can be present for decades without causing symptoms. Uh, that's a, that's a point that we need to reestablish uh, constantly because our mind kind of plays tricks on us to where we see gallstone and we instantly think that is the root of all the problems. But many times gallstones can be present without causing problems for long periods of time. Biliary colic, uh, as we've kind of already gone over, is sporadic and unpredictable pain. It increases steadily over about 10 to 20 minutes, then gradually resolves over 30 to 90 minutes. And so usually within the matter uh, of several hours, uh, pain is no longer in existence. And so uh, you kind of just chalk it up to maybe indigestion, uh, things like that, and you don't give it too much thought. Another thing is indigestion, uh, dyspepsia. Belching and bloating, all of these things can be a symptom of colithiasis. So, how do you actually find colithiasis? Uh, number one, uh, an abdominal x ray. Uh, you'll get these quite often uh, where patients are having abdominal pain or generalized abdominal pain, and you'll do uh, an abdominal x ray. It may be uh, what we call acute ab series, where you're doing a chest, uh, an upright, and a flat abdomen, or it could be just a KUB. Uh, either way, um, you might or might not find a gallstone. Uh, remember that it's going to have to be um, very, very dense for you to be able to distinguish it on uh, just plain film x-ray because of the density differences and how uh, conventional radiography has a tendency to kind of blur everything together. A CT abdomen and pelvis, you're not guaranteed to see stones on a CT abdomen and pelvis either, uh, depending on what the density is. Uh, MRI uh, kind of mirrors the same results for CT. However, ultrasound and HIDA are the two go to exams for this. Ultrasound, you're going to see uh, pretty pretty much everything that you need to. You're going to see sludge and you're also going to see uh, the stones in the gallbladder. And so ultrasound is invaluable when it comes to evaluating the gallbladder. A HIDA scan once again is used to distinguish whether the gallbladder is actually functioning or not. Um, because you can have these stones in the gallbladder or you can have no stones in the gallbladder and the gallbladder will be functioning or not functioning. So it becomes important to evaluate whether the gallbladder is actually functioning as it is supposed to. So in terms of looking at CT, a CT has a sensitivity of about 85%, which is good but not great uh, when you compare it to ultrasound. Gallstones also vary in density. Uh, you can have negative numbers, which indicate fat density or cholesterol stones, or you can have very high positive numbers, which are going to be calcified stones. And so you may not see tons of um, calcifications because not all gallstones will have calcifications. And so because of this, CT has about a 15% window of missing stones. A fissured stones may have streaks of air. Some gallstones may not be seen on CT because they are isodense with bile, which means that they have the same density as bile. And so that's one of the things that we don't understand uh, or we can't actually pull them out in CT because some of these stones, we don't even know that they're there. And so it always cracks me up when uh, you have an ER physician order a, a CT for gallstones or to evaluate the gallbladder because um, we might or might not be able to see it. And just because we don't see it, on CT doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Uh, usually your best choice, if you have it, is utilizing ultrasound to evaluate the gallbladder. So here we see, um, actually, uh, this patient probably is in severe pain. We have a large calcified gallstone here. And then as we look at the neck, we have another large calcified gallstone. Um, this this one has more calcification than potentially this one, 
uh, but we do see both gallstones. And so uh, this patient does probably have severe pain, probably due to distended gallbladder, uh, and probably needs to have this out because uh, stone number one is actually blocking probably any uh, release of bile at all. Here is uh, something that you can see um, quite often as well. Uh, you don't have to have these big, huge stones, but you can have many, many small stones. And that's the case on this patient. Uh, the gallbladder looks a little more contracted, so uh, that's another thing about CT. Uh, sometimes you're going to see contracted gallbladders. Uh, remember, the gallbladder can become contracted simply by smelling food. Um, some patients... Uh, when we when we phrase nothing by mouth, they kind of take that to mean well as long as I don't swallow something, I'm good to go. And so they'll put maybe some gum in their mouth, and the gum can actually contract the gallbladder as well, uh, simply because of dissolving the sugars and the body thinking well I'm getting ready to get some food going into my my stomach, so I need to start gearing up everything for releasing and. Because of that, basically uh, the gallbladder contracts, and so this patient does have probably a contracted gallbladder as well, and that could be where the pain is actually coming from because of the contraction. But we do see that we have some air in the wall of the gallbladder, and so uh, probably uh, this air will be a reason to remove the gallbladder. But you do see that we have uh, small calcified stones. So there looks about five stones in this patient. And so um could be very, very painful. This one is perhaps the most impressive uh, scan that we have. Uh, one thing to notice is that this patient is laying face down on the table. Here is the patient table. And so the patient is actually laying down and we've reversed these images so it looks typically like a normal CT. And so the patient must be in so much pain that they refuse to lay on uh, their back. And that kind of fits with some of the symptoms of uh, gallstones or cholecystitis. Um, here you have the gallbladder and uh, you kind of have something that looks like air here but then you have one two three stones and they get progressively larger as we're going out towards the neck and so uh, this patient doesn't have much room for any bowel because of all the all the gallstones in the gallbladder and so I would imagine that this patient is ready to have their gallbladder removed as well. This patient has very dense stones. As we can see, uh, the gallbladder may be slightly distended, but notice there's no wall thickening on this. But you have two very, very calcified stones here. So that brings us to biliary obstruction. Biliary obstruction refers to the blockage of any duct that carries bile from the liver to the gallbladder or from the gallbladder to the small intestine. Disorders of the biliary tract affect a significant portion of the worldwide population and the overwhelming majority of cases are attributable to cholithiasis. In the United States, 20% of People older than 65 years of age have gallstones. The major sign and symptom of biliary obstruction result directly from the failure of bile to reach its proper destination. Uh, the incidence of biliary obstruction is approximately five cases per 1,000 people. So uh, there's two uh, types of biliary obstruction. We have intrahepatic and extrahepatic. If we break these down and look at the root words, we have intra and extra. Intra means inside. 
Uh, extra means outside. And so if we actually look at these, uh, intrahepatic means uh, things like hepatitis and cirrhosis, things that are inherently going on with the liver that will cease uh, to have the liver actually work effectively. Uh, extrahepatic means things like neoplasm, stone disease, and biliary stricture, meaning that uh, the liver is functioning correctly, but because there are other things involved uh, outside of the liver, uh, that there really is no bile being produced or bile is not able to go where it needs to. So I uh, just keep these in mind. This means uh, intrahepatic means inside the liver. So uh, something inherently in, uh, wrong about the liver. And uh, extrahepatic means outside the liver, which means that there's something else going on, like you have stones in your gallbladder. So the associated symptoms of biliary obstruction, I'm sure we've all seen this. Uh, jaundice, uh, patients getting this orange type yellow color to uh, their skin plus their eyes. Uh, so that that's very obvious. Uh, some patients go a little more orange, some patients go a little yellow. Um, uh, it's all kind of demonstrated for biliary obstruction. Weight loss, usually weight loss simply because you can't eat, uh, because everything you try to eat absolutely kills you. Uh, high fever, uh, that kind of goes without saying, uh, due to the inflammation and uh, adenopathy, meaning that you have uh, lymph nodes that are actually uh, enlarged that you can feel and demonstrate simply because of all of the other things going on. So how do you diagnose biliary obstruction? Number one, lab tests such as serum bilirubin and alkaline phosphatase uh, to indicate how the liver is actually functioning and then how much bilirubin is actually in the blood. Uh, ultrasound, once again, is still the gold standard. Uh, what you want to have uh, to kind of demonstrate biliary obstruction. CT and MRI. CT is somewhat effective just as MRI is. But once again, gold standard for hepatobiliary imaging is ultrasound. So what you look for in terms of CT is multiple branching ground or oval low density tubular structures which represent dilated biliary ducts. A dilatation of the common ball duct and the pancreatic head uh, seen as a round fluid density tube larger than 7 millimeters. Or enlargement of the gallbladder to greater than 5 centimeters diameter, uh, which occurs when the obstruction is distal to the cystic duct. So uh, here we have dilated tubules. You see here. Here. Uh, that is what you're typically looking for. And you kind of see that mirrored here as well. You have dilated the tubules. You also have air. So let you know that there is something more uh, serious going on here. But for the most part, there is very few images in terms of biliary obstruction. We typically look for cholecystitis and uh, stones, and, and that's typically what we're seeing, uh, more so than these dilation of these tubules. Gallbladder cancer. Uh, gallbladder cancer is the fifth most common GI cancer in the United States, the most common compatibility cancer. Uh, cancer of the biliary tract include uh, cholangiosarcoma or carcinoma, uh, cancers which arise from the uh, bile duct epithelium, uh, the antilla of water cancer, and gallbladder cancer. All subtypes of biliary tract cancers are rare and have an overall poor prognosis and are difficult to diagnose. And so, that's one of the things that kind of uh, surprises a lot of people is that you can get cancer of the gallbladder. Uh, most patients think that 
you just have your gall letter removed and that's it. But as we see, uh, because they are so rare, uh, we haven't had a chance to really study them uh, to the full degree that we have some cancers like lung. Uh, and because of that, we really don't know what's best to treat it for. Sometimes we go so long before actual treatment begins that I, that the prognosis is very, very poor. Gallbladder cancer incident increases with age and is more common in women. Uh, most patients have a regional disease or distant metastasis at presentation. Therefore, the prognosis in gallbladder disease is poor with a five year survival rate of 15 to 20 percent. And so, uh, what you need to take from the second bullet point is that basically, by the time that you start actually having the symptoms or uh, actually noticing the symptoms of uh, gallbladder cancer, you've actually had mets to other portions of your body. And by that point in time, uh, it's spread to a point that it's almost untreatable. And that's why we see five-year survival rates being so low. Patients with stage 1A disease, or T1NOMO, uh, should be cured with a simple cholecystectomy. So basically, uh, patients who are in the beginning stage of gallbladder carcinoma, uh, you should be able to remove the gallbladder and the patient actually uh, be fine, which is amazing. But as things progress, even a radical cholecystectomy will not cure it. Uh, the one-year survival rate for advanced gallbladder cancer is less than 5%. Median survival is two to four months. And so basically, as the staging increases, uh, their survival rate decreases. So um, as you can see, it becomes very, very dangerous. So what potentially causes gallbladder carcinoma? Uh, one thing that has been hypothesized is chronic gallstones. Uh, you just have gallstones in the gallbladder and they just stay and irritate, irritate, irritate. And over the course of time, you have gallbladder carcinoma. Uh, calcifications of the gallbladder, such as porcelain gallbladder, in 10 to 25% of the cases, uh, which... Uh, Increased incidence of gallbladder cancer. Uh, Crohn's, leucolitis, ulcerative colitis, occupational chemical exposure, estrogens, typhoid carriers, uh, anomalous pancreo, uh, pancreato biliary junction, duct junction, uh, gallbladder polyps. Uh, all of these things can increase the risk of gallbladder cancer, but as you can see, uh, because the list is so long, that we really haven't narrowed it down to what could be effective in causing gallbladder carcinoma. Gallbladder cancer symptoms mirror those of gallstones and biliary colic. Some common symptoms are jaundice, anorexia, and weight loss. So as you'll notice, uh, the symptoms are virtually identical to those symptoms that you might have actually had for gallstones or cholecystitis. And so because of that, uh, many times it's actually hard to distinguish whether something uh, a little more uh, sinister is actually going on than gallstones. And so you, everything gets talked up to gallstones until... Uh, the gallbladder is removed and, and things are noticed that maybe it wasn't just gallstones or cholecystitis. So how do they actually diagnose gallbladder cancer? Uh, number one is uh, a tumor marker, uh, CA19-9, LFTs, or liver functioning enzymes, a CBC and comprehensive metabolic panel, all of these things will kind of just let you see how well thing, uh, systems in the body are performing. Uh, ultrasound, once again the gold standard, 
uh, CT and MRI. But the best thing to really diagnose gallbladder cancer will be uh, surgical removal of the gallbladder with uh, analysis to really uh, determine what cell types are in it and see if there's any cancerous cells. Uh, that, that will be the most surefire way. So what does it look like on CT? Uh, you could potentially see a polypoid and soft tissue mass put in the gallbladder. Focal or diffuse thickening of the gallbladder. A mass containing gallstones replaces the gallbladder and invades the adjacent liver. So obviously this last bullet point is uh, what you're going to see when uh, the gallbladder cancer has actually progressed to a, a, a very, uh, very poor prognosis state because it has invaded the liver and probably met other portions of the body as well. So uh, on this image, it might be hard for you to kind of distinguish this. But here we have the gallbladder, and we have what looks to be kind of the outline of the gallbladder here, but then we have this here. And uh, it is what I've kind of filled in here that's kind of concerning because it looks like it's encrouching into the liver uh, and it would be very helpful to kind of see coronals and sagittals to just really distinguish whether it's actually going into the liver but it looks like it's trying to uh, encrouch into the liver and because of that uh, it's kind of worrisome so this would probably be uh, maybe uh, an initial stage of gallbladder carcinoma this is um, not uh, an early stage, but uh, really uh, probably a later stage in gallbladder carcinoma. Uh, we see that we have in the circle, in this yellow circle, uh, the gallbladder. And uh, basically, if you remember the last bullet point, it was uh, a mass basically. Uh, with stones in it uh, replaces the gallbladder and that's what you're seeing here this is just a big huge mass now and you have a gallbladder stone on the inside of it and it's actually going into the liver and uh, be presumable to say that this is actually gone into other portions of the body as well Okay, and here is basically the end result of gallbladder carcinoma. You have a gallbladder here. And notice you have very much uneven thickening of the wall, and you have what looks to be a mass here and here. And it has progressed to an extent that we have. pretty much uh, obliterated the liver as well. Uh, there's areas all over the liver, not able to see the pancreas. Uh, kidneys look still okay, uh, but probably uh, in addition to uh, the liver and the gallbladder, we could actually see some in the lungs as well. Uh, but this, uh, it could be asked, well, how do you know that this is not cysts in the liver? And the, the thing that I say here is, uh, look at the enhancement patterns on this. That is what's going to be your differentiation between cyst and uh, being a mass on the inside of the liver. Uh, it's the enhancement patterns and at the borders and so this patient probably doesn't have a very long lifespan left okay so that brings us to cirrhosis 
Cirrhosis represents the final common histological pathway for a wide variety of chronic liver diseases. The term cirrhosis was first introduced by Lenneck in 1826. You probably want to keep that in mind. Uh, cirrhosis was first documented in 1926. Uh, many forms of liver injury are marked by fibrosis. Fibrosis is, a defined, is defined as an excess deposition of the components of extracellular matrix, uh, such as collagens, glycoproteins, protoglycans uh, within the liver. Most patients, uh, in most patients, cirrhosis is not a reversible process. A cirrhosis is defined histologically as a diffuse hepatic process characterized by fibrosis and the conversion of normal liver architecture into structurally abnormal nodules. And so basically, uh, what we'll find is that fib uh, cirrhosis basically replaces normal liver tissue, healthy liver tissue, with this fibrous, dense material, uh, which basically uh, decreases the liver functionality. Cirrhosis is the ninth leading cause of death in the United States. It is, re it is responsible for 1.2% of all United States deaths. So what causes cirrhosis? Uh, hepatitis C, 26%. Alcoholic liver disease, 21%. A hepatitis C plus alcoholic liver disease, 15%. Uh, cryptogenic cases, uh, 18%, and many of these cases are actually due to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Hepatitis B, uh, which may be coincident with uh, hepatitis D, 15%, miscellaneous 5%. And so I don't expect you to memorize all of these numbers or all of these causes. But the one thing that I do want you to understand is that cirrhosis often gets attributed to being uh, an alcoholic disease. And if we look at this percentage here and this percentage here, then we come to the conclusion that it is not an alcoholic disease. Uh, I know several people who have never touched alcohol in their life and they have cirrhosis and uh, uh, a lot of times it kind of we hear the word cirrhosis it kind of instantly goes into your head well this person must have drunk themselves into this but if you'll notice alcoholic liver disease is only 21 percent of the cause of cirrhosis there are many other causes and uh, in like cryptogenic cases Many times, uh, patients are actually born, it's, it's passed down through heredity, uh, and they just develop uh, fatty liver disease. And so, uh, that's one of the things that I want to kind of stress, is that cirrhosis does not instantly mean that this person has caused this, because of drinking too much. Uh, actually, it's quite the opposite. Many times there are not symptoms of cirrhosis until damage is ex extensive. Uh, some possible symptoms are fatigue, bleeding easy, ascites, loss of appetite, nausea, swelling in the extremities, and weight loss. Uh, on patients who have cirrhosis, uh, the most obvious are fatigue, ascites, uh, swelling in the extremities. These are uh, potentially your big three because fatigue, because they have all of the societies, and because of the societies, they have swollen in their extremities because the body is not able to function uh, adequately. So, uh, the workup for diagnosis uh, lab tests such as CBC comp and liver functioning enzymes, then also CT, MRI, and ultrasound. Uh, CT and MRI can do an excellent job of kind of demonstrating the borders of cirrhosis and uh, some to some degree the intracellular matrix of the liver. However, uh, ultrasound once again still does an excellent job of being able to point out what is going on in terms of cirrhosis. 
So what you're going to look for in terms of CT is liver surface nodularity. And so what you have, or what we're talking about, liver surface nodularity, is the liver typically has this nice, smooth appearance, something like this. However, when we actually get cirrhosis, you're going to see looks something like this. And you notice how it's not smooth anymore, but it has what looks to be like prominent nodules coming out of it. That's what we mean by nodularity. Uh, contracted liver with ascites, uh, you're going to see uh, potentially maybe nodules and tons of ascitic fluid being around the liver. Uh, atrophy of the posterior segments, the right lobe, or an enlarged caudate lobe, lateral segments, the left lobe, a prominent umbilical vein, or a regular enhancement. However, usually what you're going to see is nodularity, which we have here. Uh, we have the nodularity. Notice how we have, it almost looks like pitting. Then we do have acidic fluid here and here. And so uh, that's just kind of demonstrating to you uh, basically what cirrhosis looks like. Uh, this is even more severe. We do have the nodularity. And so uh, the liver has just become basically a fraction of itself. And we have all of this acidic fluid. Quite a large amount of fluid here. And so that is basically cirrhosis. Hepatomegaly. Uh, this should be uh, pretty easy for you to distinguish. Uh, hepato means liver, megaly meaning large. Uh, this is a condition where the liver is larger than normal in size. It's much like congestive heart failure, it isn't a disease but it is a sign of an underlying problem. You want to star this, because I guarantee you, you will be seeing this uh, to some extent later. It's not a disease. Uh, many people want to uh, say hepatomegaly like it is a disease, but it really isn't. It's just a sign of something underlying going on. Uh, it can be caused by cirrhosis, hepatitis, uh, NAFLD, uh, hepatic carcinoma, lymphoma, and CHF. Associated symptoms are abdominal pain, fatigue, jaundice. Uh, the route for diagnosis is number one, physical exam, uh, palpitation of the liver margins to see if you can feel where the liver actually ends. Um, May or not may or may not be able to do this. Uh, lab tests such as liver function enzymes, CT, MRI, and then biopsy. Uh, usually, CT is favored over MRI simply because of the speed at which you can actually demonstrate the anatomy. Uh, but MRI is still adequate for this. Uh, and then the biopsy is basically utilized to see what is going on. You go in and take a core sample of the liver and see what is actually occurring. And so what we should see here on this slide is uh, the liver being over uh, 21 centimeters. Uh, that is what will be defined as hepatomegaly. And so what what you would normally do is you take from the highest portion which would be here and then run it to the lowest portion here and if this is greater than 21 this patient does have hepatomegaly but uh, this person also does have a spleen that is insanely large here as well.
also um, this uh, really is not as clear of a sign of hepatomegaly but one thing to notice is that you have uh, the liver extending from the right side all the way over to the left side of the body and because of this uh, the liver is extremely large so it would be safe to assume that this patient has a pathology as well. Okay, hepatocellular carcinoma. Hepatocellular carcinoma, or HCC, is a primary malignancy of the hepatocyte, generally leading to death within, this, within 6 to 20 months. Hepatocellular carcinoma frequently arises in the setting of cirrhosis, appearing 20 to 30 years following the initial insult to the liver. However, 25% of patients have no history or risk factors for the development of cirrhosis. The extent of hepatic dysfunction limits treatment options, and as many patients die of liver failure as from tumor progression. However, because the latency period from hepatic damage to hepatocellular carcinoma develops, but it's very long. It may be many years until the incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma uh, decreases as a result of these interventions. Late in the disease, metastasis may develop in the lung, portal vein, periportal nodes, bone, or brain. The cure is through surgery. Uh, it's possible in fewer than 5% of all patients. Uh, this is supposed to be fewer, not fever. A uh, median survival from time to diagnosis is generally six months. A uh, median age at diagnosis is 65 and rarely occurs in people younger than 40. So uh, hepatocellular carcinoma is very, very dangerous. Uh, it's believed to be caused by cirrhosis, alcohol, Hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus, and hemochromatosis. Okay, so the symptoms of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma are pruritus, uh, jaundice, splenomegaly, variceal bleeding, chexia, which is basically uh, a decrease in muscle mass or wasting away of the body. Uh, increasing abdominal girth, uh, such as in portal vein occlusion by thrombus, with rapid development of mesites. Hepatic encephalopathy, uh, uh, right upper quadrant pain, all these can be uh, symptoms of hepatocellular carcinoma. So the diagnosis for hepatocellular carcinoma uh, can result from a lab test, which should show results consistent with cirrhosis, ultrasound, CT, and MRI. Uh, any of these options would be adequate uh, for kind of demonstrating hepatocellular carcinoma. So what you see in CT, uh, you have three patterns of tumor growth. Uh, one is solitary tumor, which is 50%. Diffuse infiltrative, 30%, and multinodular tumor, which is 20%. Should see hypervascularity, meaning that it's very vascular in comparison to the rest of the liver. And large hepatic cellular carcinomas uh, are, are typically um, hypodense uh, on non contrast scans. Uh, they enhance heterogeneously on arterial and venous phases in contrast. Uh, small tumors uh, typically demonstrates bright homogenous enhancement on arterial phases. Uh, but the big thing to look for here is uh, hypervascularity. And so uh, here is a hepatocellular carcinoma. And notice we are having contrast enhancement uh, in, in uh, the arterial systems. And so we do see these marked areas of 
hypervascularity. And notice this is very large. Uh, here is a very extensive hepatocellular carcinoma. And notice how it enhances uh, to a large degree. There's very, uh, there's quite a few nodules all over, uh, and so. Uh, this hypervascularity or enhancing more than the surrounding tissue is indicative of hepatocellular uh, carcinoma. Here is an excellent example of uh, increasing uh, or hypervascularity. Notice how white this is and how white this is in comparison to your normal living tissue, which would be here. Uh, so it has excellent enhancement and so we can be absolutely positive uh, that both of these areas are hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, this is uh, one of those scans that kind of doesn't mirror what uh, the hypervascularity but we have enough uh, factors with this that we can kind of uh, imagine what this actually is. Uh, one of the things about looking for pathology on CT is that sometimes things may not actually look the way that you uh, think they're supposed to look, but you look for other clues. Uh, you have to look at other parts of this image to kind of see what you're supposed to be looking at or kind of trying to figure it out. So what we're going to do is kind of go on uh, the hunt of this, even though we do have arrows here. Uh, first clue is that we have all of these areas here. So if we look at this, we have ascites, and then we look a little closer at the liver. We have smooth border here, but then we get here, and we don't have smooth anymore. We have this nodularity, so uh, possibly cirrhosis. And so if we put these two together, then we can go back to uh, the etiology and see that cirrhosis is one of the things that could cause hepatocytosis or carcinoma. And so we see this area here, and it has this nodular appearance with streaks through it. And we can say that that is probably hepatocytosis or carcinoma, simply because of that. So many times, uh, looking for pathology in terms of CT is simply just putting the pieces together that you see. Okay, so that brings us to an hemangioma. Hemangiomas are benign masses that occur in the liver. Uh, they're made up of a tangle of blood vessels. Uh, no evidence that a benign hemangioma can transform into a malignant neoplasm. So that's always a plus in that uh, there is nothing that indicates that uh, a benign hemangioma can transform itself. Uh, the exact cause of liver hemangiomas is not known. However, there is a growing belief that causation is congenital, so you're born with it. Uh, the associated symptoms of a hemangioma are uh, pain in the right upper quadrant, feeling full after eating only a small amount of food, Lack of appetite, nausea, and vomiting. However, if you notice these symptoms, it seems that uh, almost they mirror what uh, gallbladder uh, abnormality might. So the way that you can find hemangiomas are basically three things. 
CT, MRI, and ultrasound each do a very uh, admirable job in being able to differentiate that angioma from other tissues. So what you should see in terms of CT is that on non-contrast scans, uh, they should appear as well-defined hypodense mass of the same density as other blood-filled spaces. So a uh, trick here is to pick out some other blood-filled space like um, the aorta and uh, compare the densities there. On contrast scans, uh, the arterial phase shows early peripheral nodules of contrast enhancement. Uh, the venous phase shows progressively fill-in enhancement from the periphery. Results in a uniformly enhanced image. Uh, contrast enhancement usually persists within the lesion for 20 to 30 minutes after contrast injection. So it uh, gets the contrast and holds the contrast for a very uh, long amount of time. So uh, here we have. Uh, a hemangioma. Uh, we don't really see much contrast in the aorta, so uh, there potentially may not be any IV contrast or any slight IV contrast, uh, and so we don't see uh, really that. Might see just a little bit of enhancement, uh, but remember we're not on the venous phase yet, and so we don't have fill-in enhancement. Um, but notice that it has a very different appearance than uh, hepatocellular carcinomas. Here is <clears throat> uh, a hemangioma and uh, you see this area here and you see darker hypodense areas here, here, and so these are our hypodense areas but notice we're in the arterial phase because we're going into the aorta and so because of that we're seeing some degree of enhancement in all of this area uh, with nodular uh, unenhancement here and so when we get into the venous phase uh, these darker areas will probably enhance as well Here you can see some degree of enhancement uh, with some little small spots of not being enhanced. Uh, but the, the key here is that uh, they are not as vascular as uh, the hepatocellular carcinomas. Uh, the carcinomas, they, they, become, they are very hypervascular. And hemangiomas really are hypovascular. That's why it takes so long to actually develop contrast and why they hold contrast for such a long period of time. Okay, liver metastasis. Uh, liver mets are cancerous tumors that are secondary to the primary lesion. Uh, they can come from breast cancer, colorectal cancer, esophageal, lung, melanoma, pancreatic stomach, and adrenal cancer. Uh, it can result from anorexia, or it can result in anorexia, confusion, fever, jaundice, nausea, right upper quadrant pain, sweats, and weight loss. And all of these things can be a result of an abnormality of the liver. So um, the way that you would diagnose this, uh, number one, uh, would be if you have a, a previous history of uh, cancer, then obviously you're going to be getting PET scans. Uh, but if you don't know that you have <clears throat> another uh, type of cancer, then uh, you might be discovered using ultrasound, CT, and MRI simply because of the other problems that you're having. So in terms of looking at it on CT, uh, we have well-defined, low-density, solid mass with vague peripheral enhancement. It produces a target appearance, and we'll see that in some of the images. Uh, Mets from colon cancer are typically hypovascular. So if you have colon cancer and then you see stuff appear in the liver, uh, typically you will not have a great deal of enhancement. 
This means that they are better demonstrated on the venous phase of the scan. It takes longer to actually get blood flow to them. Um, Mets from carcinoid or corico carcinoma, melanoma, pancreatic, pilot cell tumor, uh, pheochromocytoma, uh, renal cell carcinoma, thyroid cancer. All these are typically demonstrated on the arterial phase of contrast injection. Okay, here we have basically uh, liver met. And as you can see, it's kind of all over the place. Uh, you have multiple, multiple nodules on the liver. And um, we really don't see much of the target type of appearance except in this area here. Notice you have one ring and then another ring here. Uh, that's what you're looking for, a bullseye type of appearance. And uh, this would be very easy to diagnose because uh, obviously the patient does have a primary uh, form of cancer and this is a result of uh, other uh, of the metastasis. Um, once again, we have uh, large areas. They're not really uh, that vascular. We're in the arterial phase still. And so notice we do have some degree of enhancement, but not much. Uh, it would be better if we saw this in um, the vast, uh, in, in the venous phase. Uh, but we do kind of see uh, a target appearance in some of this. This one is the best. You have one little area, and then we have another area. That's, that's basically what you're looking for. Okay, this, this appearance is slightly different. Uh, we do see that it's hypervascular. Um, we have enhancement in the arterial phase. And we're getting a lot of enhancement in terms of the liver as well. So this is very vascular. We do see that we have bullseye here. And potentially this could be called a bullseye as well. So that brings us to hemochromatosis. A hemochromatosis is the abnormal accumulation of iron in the parenchymal organs leading to organ toxicity. Uh, it's the most common in inherited liver disease in white people and the most common autosomal recessive genetic disorder. A hereditary hemochromatosis is an adult onset disorder that represents an error of iron metabolism characterized by inappropriately high iron absorption resulting in progressive arm overload. So you have too much arm in the body. Excessive arm is hazardous because it produces free radical formation. The prevalence of hereditary hemochromatosis in the United States is one case in 200 to 500 individuals. So it has a remarkably high uh, occurrence rate in the United States. A hereditary hemochromatosis is a genetic heterogeneous disorder inherited as an autosomal recessive trait. It can be found on the short arm of chromosome 6. So all this keep in mind. Uh, when we're saying that it's autosomal uh, recessive, basically what we're saying is that uh, you have to be recessive for the trait. And so basically, uh, both parents would have to be, what you'd either have to have a parent that has it or carries the genetic makeup for a hemochromatosis. So um, just so we understand this, let's say that you have uh, basically, we're going to use the letter P, um, and you have parents that are carriers of it, but they don't have it. And so, if we use what we know, there would only be a 25% chance 
of actually getting uh, hemochromatosis if both parents are carriers. However, situation becomes a little different if one of the parents has hemochromatosis and the other one is a carrier and so let's say that one parent has it so there would be 50 percent chance of actually getting it however if one parent does not have or, or is not a carrier of the trait then it would be impossible to get hemochromatosis because it is a, a recessive trait uh, associated symptoms of hemochromatosis are hepatomegaly, cirrhosis, skin bronzing, diabetes, arthropathy, amenorrhea, uh, impotence, and hypogonadism, and also cardiomyopathy. So the workup for diagnosis, a uh, genetic testing to see whether you have the predisposition uh, for this chromosome, uh, CT, uh, basically uh, non-diagnostic, MRI is non-diagnostic as well. Uh, basically what we mean by non-diagnostic is uh, it's going to show you something but it, it's going to take uh, further samples and biopsies to actually demonstrate hemochromatosis as a firm diagnosis. But MRI and CT can kind of point the way for you. Uh, basically what you're going to see in terms of CT uh, for hemochromatosis is increased liver attenuation by deposition of the RNA. So basically what, what we're meaning here is the liver is going to look nice and white instead of having uh, the typical appearance of a, a gray that it normally does. And this is pretty uh, indicative of what hemochromatosis actually looks like. I notice we don't have really any contrast in the aorta or uh, inferior vena cava, none in the kidneys, and we have the liver uh, looking almost like bone, and that's because of uh, the excess iron uh, deposited inside of it. Uh, here is another example. Notice still there is no contrast inside, uh, but we're seeing that the liver is kind of standing out. It's jumping out at you because of uh, the density of it. And so that's what you're going to see. The liver is going to look very dense. It's going to have a metallic type of appearance because of the arm that's deposited. So that brings us to splenomegaly. Uh, the spleen is a functionally diverse organ with active roles in the immunosurveillance and hemopoiesis uh, uh, functions. It lies within the left upper quadrant of the peritoneal cavity. And abuts the ribs 9 through 12, the stomach, the left kidney, the splenic flexure of the colon, and the tail of the pancreas. A normal spleen weighs 150 grams and is approximately 11 centimeters in cranial caudal length. What we mean by cranial caudal is from uh, the head to the feet. And so that, that's the direction that we typically measure. Normal spleen is usually not palpable, although it can be sometimes be palpated in adolescents and individuals with a slender build. A spleen's weighing 400 to 500 grams indicate splenomegaly, and some authors consider spleen's weighing more than 1,000 grams to indicate massive splenomegaly. In many instances, the spleen enlarges as it performs its normal functions. Uh, the, the four most important normal functions of the spleen are as follows. Clearance of microorganisms and particulate antigens from the bloodstream. Synthesis of immunoglobulin G or IgG, <clears throat> propertin, an essential component of the alternate pathway of complement activation, and tufsin, uh, an immunostimulatory uh, tetrapeptide. A removal of abnormal red blood cells. An embryonic 
hematopoiesis and certain diseases. Immune response work hypertrophy, such as subacute bacterial endocarditis or infectious mononucleosis, can be a cause of splenomegaly. Uh, red blood cell destruction work hypertrophy, such as hereditary uh, spherocytosis or thalassemia major, uh, congestive, such as splenic vein thrombosis or portal hypertension, myeloproliferative, such as chronic myeloid metaplasia. Infiltrative, such as sarcoidosis and some neoplasms, and neoplastic, such as chronic lymphocytic, uh, lymphocytic leukemia, and, and the lymphomas, can all be a cause of splenomegaly. So, uh, what kind of symptoms would you have for splenomegaly? A feeble illness, such as infectious disease, a pallor, dyspnea, bruising, and or uh, Pedicia, which is a hemolytic process. History of liver disease. A weight loss, constitutional symptoms. Pancreatitis. Alcoholism. And hepatitis. So how we actually test for splenomegaly. Uh, lab results such as CBC to look for abnormalities in blood cells. Ultrasound, CT, and MRI. Each of these will allow you to measure the spleen. And that's uh, typically what we're looking for uh, so that we can really differentiate whether this patient has splenomegaly or not. So in terms of uh, splenomegaly, a size greater than 14 centimeters in any dimension is a primary sign of splenomegaly in adults. I remember for the liver, it's... 21 centimeters so uh, keep that in mind that the liver can be up to 21 centimeters but anything over 21 centimeters is considered um, hepatomegaly which is in the cranial uh, the call dad uh, direction and anything greater than 14 centimeters for the spleen is considered splenomegaly so um, here we have measurements um, from anterior to uh, posterior and then in uh, lateral to medial. And uh, you know, as we can see in the lateral medial direction, there's, it's, not, it's definitely not over 14 centimeters. However, it can be argued that in uh, the anterior to the posterior segment, it could be larger than 14 centimeters. Uh, this is more impressive. Uh, this is, you, you would measure from here to the lowest portion in one line, and this would be definitely over 14 centimeters. So, 14 centimeters would be smaller than what this actually is. So, this person does have splenomegaly. As we can look at the, the top of the body, uh, we see that kind of looks uh, possibly like a small child uh, in terms of this as well. Uh, here is the spleen as well. You would measure from here to here and uh, it would be anybody's guess whether this would actually be greater than 14 centimeters or not. Uh, but I would like to draw your attention to the liver. Um, as you can see, it has very nodular appearance. It uh, could be argued that this person does have cirrhosis as well. So that brings us to uh, splenic infarction. Uh, splenic infarction refers to occlusion of the splenic vascular supply, leading to parenchymal ischemic and subsequent tissue, uh, or parenchymal ischemia and subsequent tissue necrosis. Uh, the infarct may be segmental or it may be global. Uh, involving the entire organ. So uh, what we mean by segmental is that it involves just a small portion of the spleen whereas in terms of global it involves the entire organ. Uh, it is the result of arterial or venous compromise and is associated with heterogeneous group of diseases. 
there are numerous ideologies of splenic infarction. The vast majority, or 88%, however, are either infiltrated hematologic diseases that cause congestion of the splenic circulation by abnormal cells or thromboembolic uh, conditions that produce obstruction of larger vessels. Uh, associated symptoms of splenic infarction are left upper quadrant pain, fever, chills, nausea, vomiting, pleuritic chest pain, and left shoulder pain. So the workup for diagnosis, uh, lab test, virtually non-diagnostic. Uh, CT and pelvis with IV contrast is the current modality of choice as it provides excellent resolution, uh, excellent demonstration uh, at a very rapid pace. Uh, MRI and ultrasounds are all just a, are, are, are all close seconds uh, in terms of diagnosis. A uh, classic appearance of splenic compartment is a wedge-shaped low attenuation defect that extends to the splenic capsule. Uh, the, the important thing here is that it extends to the splenic capsule. Uh, any non-enhancing area of the spleen that extends up to the splenic capsule is likely to be an infarction. So uh, keep these two points in mind here. And what we mean by that is if we have a spleen and we have something that looks like this and all of this is darker, then this is a splenic infarction. Pancreatic cancer. Uh, the pancreas is the tenth most common side of new cancers, uh, but the pancreatic cancer is the fourth leading cause of cancer deaths among men and women, being responsible for 6% of all cancer related deaths. Uh, notoriously difficult to diagnose. At the time of diagnosis, 52% of all patients have distant disease and 26% have regional spread. Uh, the relative one year survival rate for pancreatic cancer is only 24%, and the overall five year survival rate is 5%. So, uh, as we know, pancreatic cancer is very deadly. Uh, this is uh, just further based on uh, this knowledge here. Typically, pancreatic cancer first metastasizes to regional lymph nodes, then to the liver, and less commonly to the lungs. The median age of diagnosis for pancreatic cancer is 63 years old. Uh, pancreatic carcinoma is uniformly, uh, usually a fatal disease. Collective median survival time for all patients is four to six months. So as you can see, uh, pancreatic cancer doesn't have a very good prognosis uh, at all. 40% of pancreatic cancer cases are sporadic or idiopathic, meaning that we don't really know what causes them. 30% are related to smoking, uh, which is kind of ironic because we typically associate uh, lung cancer with being a death or, or cancer to smoking, uh, but that's not the case. 20% may be associated with dietary factors. 5 to 10% are hereditary in nature. And uh, interestingly enough, diabetes may double the risk for pancreatic cancer. Uh, unfortunately, the initial symptoms of the disease are often quite nonspecific. and subtle in onset. A patients typically report the gradual onset of nonspecific symptoms such as anorexia, malaise, nausea, fatigue, and other uh, mid-epigastric or back pains. A significant weight loss is a characteristic feature of pancreatic cancer. Uh, so that's one of the things you know, due to anorexia uh, that and, and the nausea clumping together that uh, cause you to decrease in weight. Uh, but once again, uh, these symptoms uh, usually are so non-specific that they get attributed to other things, and uh, pancreatic cancer is kind of a distant thought. So lab tests are pretty much non-diagnostic, and so that brings us to the imaging modalities, such as CT, ultrasound, MRI, and PET. Uh, ERCPs, um, not utilized as much now. 
So what does pancreatic cancer actually look like in terms of CT? Pancreatic cancer uh, will appear as a hypodense mass that enhances minimally compared with normal pancreatic function. 60% uh, of pancreatic cancers are in the head, 15% in the body, 5% in the tail, and 20% is diffused throughout. So the, your, your most common location is going to be in the head of the pancreas. Uh, and so, as we all know, the head of the pancreas sits in the uh, C loop of the duodenum. And so basically, you're going to see uh, closer to the right side of the body is where you're going to see uh, the cancer. Uh, pancreatic or clinton ball ducts are commonly dilated uh, in terms of the, the structures presented in pancreatic carcinomas. And so I'm not going to lie that uh, sometimes pancreatic cancers are very hard to distinguish. Uh, we have this area here, uh, but this is a very difficult image to really discern whether this is a pancreatic cancer or not. Uh, this one is much easier. Uh, you can see this area here. And then you can see minimal highlighting due to uh, the contrast. Then you can also see what looks to be like stranding coming out of it. And so this is uh, a pancreatic carcinoma. Uh, here's another one at the head of the pancreas, just like the other. Uh, you have this area here, and you have uh, just this uh, kind of hazy appearance with uh, minimal amounts of highlighting due to contrast enhancement, uh, but you really don't see a whole lot of the pancreas. But based on this, this is uh, pancreatic carcinoma as well. But the reason pancreatic carcinomas are so hard to really uh, distinguish is the fact that uh, we have these things called pancreatic pseudocysts. Uh, pseudocysts are best defined as a localized fluid collection that is rich in amylase and other pancreatic enzymes. It has a non epithelialized wall consisting of fibrous and granulation tissue. It is usually uh, appears several weeks after the onset of pancreatitis. Uh, strictly defining the type of fluid collection is very important when reviewing pancreatic fluid collections. Uh, the fluid in pseudocysts usually contain very high amounts of amylase lipase and trypsin, although the amylase level may decrease over time. And the reason I say that uh, pancreatic cancers are very hard to distinguish uh, from pseudocysts is the fact that pseudocysts will almost look the same as a pancreatic carcinoma. And because of that, uh, it becomes very difficult to distinguish which one is uh, actually cancerous and non-cancerous. A pancreatic pseudocyst can be single or multiple. Multiple cysts are more frequently observed in patients with alcoholism and can be multiple in about 15% of cases. Uh, size varies from 2 to 30 centimeters, so they can get quite large. And about one third of pseudocysts manifest in the head of the gland and two thirds appear in the tail. So here's something that you can kind of distinguish uh, more appear in the tail than they appear in the head. However, uh, still one third of pseudocysts appear in the head and many of our images will kind of demonstrate this fact as well so it becomes very difficult to really discern which is which acute or chronic pancreatitis or abdominal complications uh, will cause pseudocysts uh, typically we usually say that uh, Usually, if you've had pancreatitis, then that sets you up for having a pancreatic pseudocyst, uh, usually. However, uh, the second bullet point is very uh, important to understand. Uh, if no history of pancreatitis or trauma exists, the diagnosis must be carefully confirmed. Uh, because if you don't have a history uh, or anything to really cause this pancreatic pseudocyst, there is that potential that it could be a pancreatic carcinoma. So it's very important that you don't miss this. 
So uh, the symptoms of a pancreatic cyst are persistent abdominal pain, anorexia, jaundice, and sepsis. But the, the interesting thing is, if you notice most of these symptoms, uh, they almost mirror the, the same symptoms that you would have with uh, a pancreatic carcinoma. And so it can be very confusing to keep straight sometimes. Uh, the workup for diagnosis, uh, we do see differentiation between the workup for diagnosis with this, though. Uh, we have lab tests that we can utilize, such as amylase lipase and liver function and enzymes, really uh, demonstrate how well the pancreas is actually working. We also have ultrasound and CT, uh, both do a remarkable job. Uh, ultrasound is uh, sometimes more subjective uh, because if the patient is eight, you have a large amount of fecal material inside the abdomen. Uh, then the pancreas becomes kind of uh, a very difficult area to actually utilize and see. However, CT doesn't have these problems. So in terms of looking at CT, uh, we see that pancreatic single cyst appear as low density collections of fluid, cellular debris, or blood. Uh, distinct walls are well de uh, defined and uh, of variable thickness. Uh, most are unilocular, meaning that there is no septations. So basically, um, there is no appearance of this. Uh, signs of pancreatitis are usually present. So uh, that's the important thing is that there are going to be uh, telltale signs of there being pancreatitis at some point in time, uh, which will cause the pseudocyst. So here we have a pancreatic pseudocyst. And uh, notice that we do have defined borders here, and uh, they're in its unilocular. There is no differentiation on the inside of it. So this is pretty safe to assume that this is pancreatic pseudocyst. Here uh, it becomes a little more murky. Uh, this is in the head of the pancreas. We have this large area. Uh, it appears to be too large for uh, possibly a pancreatic carcinoma. Uh, but we can't really be sure. And so let me erase the circle. And notice that there's no uh, septations on the inside of it. So that's a good sign. Uh, but what really makes it a good sign is we have this kind of stranding appearance here. Uh, and because of that, we can pretty much assume that this is a pancreatic pseudocyst and be uh, pretty pretty well confirmed with that diagnosis based on patient probably just having uh, pancreatitis. Uh, so knowing if the patient has pancreatitis uh, is very difficult to really discern. Uh, so we have to know what pancreatitis actually is. Uh, First of all, the pancreas is a gland located in the upper posterior abdomen. It's responsible for insulin production, uh, such as when it's the endocrine pancreas, and the manufacture and secretion of digestive enzymes when it is the exocrine pancreas, leading to carbohydrate, fat, and protein metabolism. Uh, approximately 80% of the gross weight of the pancreas supports exocrine function, and the remaining 20% is involved with endocrine function. So the pancreas uh, for the most part is an exocrine gland, but it does function in its endocrine system as well. Um, and both processes are vital to the human body. And the pancreas accounts for only 0.1% of total body weight, but has 13 times the protein producing capacity of the liver and the recto, <clears throat> recto, recto uh, endothelial system uh, combined which make up 4% of the total body weight. So basically, uh, the pancreas doesn't weigh a whole lot, but it is responsible for doing a lot of things. And so the pancreas is very important. Uh, pancreatitis is an inflammatory process in which pancreatic enzymes auto digest the gland. So uh, this this form of auto digestion will give the pancreas a very unique appearance in terms of pancreatitis. 
The gland sometimes heals without any impairment of function or any morphological changes. Uh, this process is known as acute pancreatitis. So basically, uh, it happens and then the patient gets over it. Uh, pancreatitis can also recur intermittently, contributing to the functional and morphological loss of the gland. Recurrent attacks are referred to as chronic pancreatitis. So basically, it can happen and then happens over and over and over and over again. And that's uh, the result of chronic pancreatitis. Both forms of pancreatitis present with, uh, in the emergency department with acute clinical findings. Uh, so what causes pancreatitis? Uh, the median age of onset depends on the etiology. Following our median ages of onset for various etiologies. Alcohol related is 39 years of age. Biliary tract related is 69. Trauma related 66 years. Drug induced etiology 42 years. ERCP related 58 years. Age related 31. And vasculitis related is 36. So uh, there's varying ages in which pancreatitis can really manifest itself. Uh, the associated symptoms are abdominal pain, uh, classified as dull, boring, and steady. Um, and what we mean by boring is not, uh, I'm tired of this, uh, I want to go to sleep or something. But really, it boring means that it feels like someone is just kind of pressing something into you and just keeps on pressing and pressing and pressing and pressing, trying to bore a hole through you. Uh, anorexia nausea, vomiting, and uh, basically what what you typically see with pancreatitis is uh, kind of a combination of abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. Uh, all of this just kind of combines uh, together. Lab test, uh, typically you look for amylase and lipase, uh, and what this is going to do is really um, demonstrate whether the liver in, uh, or the pancreatic enzymes are kind of elevated, indicating uh, inflammation, but also C-reactive protein, uh, or CRP, um, that is utilized to really demonstrate whether there is inflammation going on in the body. Uh, an elevation of this indicates that. Uh, ultrasound, CT, MRI, and ERCP. Uh, ERCP not quite as common now. Uh, ultrasound, CT, and MRI, uh, each has their benefits. Uh, ultrasound, uh, sometimes has, once again, difficulty in diagnosing pancreatitis simply because of the fact that uh, if the patient does have a, a lot of stool in their body, uh, just not able to really penetrate that. But CT and MRI do do an excellent job of really kind of standing out pancreatitis. So uh, pancreatitis in terms of CT, uh, appears as focal or diffuse enlargement of the pancreas. You have a decrease in density of the pancreatic parenchyma, blurring of the margins of the pancreas, fluid collections in the pancreatic bed, pseudocyst, necrosis of the pancreas, phlegmon, which is a mass of edema and inflammation, and or an abscess. Uh, typically what you're going to look for is uh, maybe some of the blurring of the margins of the pancreas, a necrosis of the pancreas, Phlegmon and uh, decrease in density of the pancreatic parenchyma. Pancreas is just going to give the appearance of not looking really healthy. Uh, here is a patient who has pancreatitis, and we have uh, well, it's kind of the pancreas here, but we have all of this stuff going on the outside, and we have this stranding going on here and here. And so that is uh, a classic presentation of pancreatitis. Uh, it just looks pretty uh, horrible in the body. Uh, here is another presentation of pancreatitis. Here is the pancreas. And notice all of this hazy appearance. All this. That is uh, the inflammation or phlegmon. Here's another one. Uh, this is possibly the, the most prolific phlegmon that we have seen. You have all of the stranding. And notice how um, there's really no definition 
to the pancreas. It just looks like this strange ball of, of tissue on the inside of the patient. Uh, this is typical of pancreatitis. This is a classic presentation.